count. I'm Steve Ball, but on today's edition, I am in Boston, but my guest, Jeff Cobb, is in Japan. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for uh, getting up early for me and uh, and doing this interview. Well, Appreciate thanks for, it. Thanks for staying up late for me because, you know, there's so much going on in professional wrestling right now. And obviously you are a former IWGP tag team champion and Ring of Honor TV champion. And yet these two companies, Ring of Honor, uh, coming out with Tony Khan. And then you have, of course, New Japan making a huge splash in 2023 with Wrestle Kingdom. So much is happening. Let's talk about the biggest story, I think, of the year so far. We'll talk about you in just a minute. Let's put you over here for a second. But Sasha Banks, Mercedes Monet, is now in New Japan going after Kairi Sen's championship belt in February. This is huge. Did you ever think we're going to see Sasha Banks, Mercedes, in New Japan? Uh, You know, uh, I learned early on uh, in pro wrestling, you never say never because uh, you, you never know who's going to show up anywhere, uh, especially if they're not under contract at uh, one of the big companies that won't let them go other places. So mm-hmm. uh, it was really cool to see um, her show up. And it's great because, you know, it's like from what I've heard, like she loves wrestling. She loves professional wrestling. And at the same token, you know, it like she's getting a chance and opportunity to wrestle different girls. And from our from the IWGP New Japan stardom standpoint, it's good because she has a lot of fans that may not know Japanese wrestling per se. So yes. it brings a lot of eyes um, for both sides. And and I think it's a good partnership. Yeah. Cause in February you have Mercedes going for the women's championship already, like boom, instantly. And I think people are getting worried. They're like, Oh no, it's kind of going to lose the championship belt. Or is Mercedes going to get it right away? Is she, Mercedes going to lose right away? Like that's the appeal of this matchup. And I think that's what makes the tickets already out the window because people are so excited because just like wrestling, nobody wants to see a movie and know the ending. No one wants to right. watch a wrestling match and already predict, Oh, that person's going to win because there's so much on the line. But Wrestle Kingdom was a huge moment for so many different people. But last year, you were on the Wrestle Kingdom card. This year, you were not on the Wrestle Kingdom card. How do you feel about that? A little disappointed? Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm a, I'm disappointed. Uh, but I feel like uh, the United Empire was represented um, as a whole with the uh, IWB Junior Tag Championships. And then on the same token with uh, Will Ospreay getting a, a big platform in and wrestling Kenny Omega. Um, yeah, uh, selfishly, I would have liked to have been um, on the main show, but obviously, you know, that's not in the that's not in the card. Uh, and you know, there's only so much space that and that people can be put on, and and storyline wise, going into it, uh, you know, I wasn't figuring in, but you know, it's it's not a problem. You know, there's it just means I got to work harder. Right. I've talked to many wrestlers in the past where, like, say, uh, I talked to Ricochet from the WWE when he was Intercontinental Champion, and they had two nights of WrestleMania, and he wasn't on either night, and that was back-to-back versus Wrestle Kingdom is being spread apart uh, this year with different dates and and different locations. Though, the next event after Wrestle Kingdom, you were on that uh, New Year's Dash, and you got to be in a tag team match with Kenny Omega and Okada, uh, unfortunately. Didn't win that one either, but you know, we hey, wins and losses matter, but does the pay come in the, the pockets? I guess it did. So now though, you lost that match. Huge opportunity for you there as well. And it seems that maybe, just maybe, you'll be going for either Kenny's championship or Okada's championship. Which one do you have your eyes on, or do you want both? Again, selfishly, I would love both. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I'd like carrying both of those championships around. But uh, I mean, realistically, uh, you know, I've tangled with the uh, Okada already, and now this uh, like Kenny Omega having the United States Championship kind of, kind of uh, wets my whistle a little bit. You know, it makes me uh, very intrigued, and because I've never, uh, I've never got a chance to fight him, and now he has. There's another incentive to fight him, uh, being the being a champion, and uh, you know, I. You know, people say like, you know, why is why isn't a uh, Osprey getting a return match or whatever? And, and uh, you know, that's not my um, that's not my department. My department mm-hmm. is just uh, uh, I don't want to say I don't want to curse on your thing, but uh, it's the, pretty much the suplex people kick ass and take names. And and if me being in the main event on uh, New Year's Dash uh, puts me in line for a 
a championship shot against either Kenny Omega or uh, Kazuchika Okada, then so be it. And my my goal is going to be the same, just win championships and bring it back over to Japan and uh, around my shoulder, around my waist. I think you bring up a good point of, of the fresh matchup between you and Kenny Omega since it hasn't happened. I have seen you and Okada go at it before. So having you and Kenny Omega go at it, U.S. Championship, maybe bringing that over to AEW, more AEW, New Japan, Forbidden Door action, because that pay-per-view did really good business when it happened last year. And I think people are all waiting for it to happen again this year. And, and you know, if it does happen, or actually before it doesn't, do you think it'll happen? Do you think we'll see another AEW versus New Japan? Because, again, on Wrestle Kingdom, you had Carl Anderson, contracted WWE wrestler, Kenny Omega, AEW contracted wrestler, you had Mercedes Monet, uh, Sasha Banks, you know, now a freelancer, uh, a free agent going anywhere. Like this Wrestle Kingdom card wasn't just stacked with New Japan talent. It was stacked with everything around the wrestling world. It became like the hub of wrestling. So do you think we're going to see an AEW New Japan one more time forbidden door? Um, You know, going back to, uh, I think it was uh, last last summer when the first Forbidden Door happened, uh, the response was really well. Uh, it was a sold out United Center. It was it was amazing. Uh, so, I mean, it'd be it'd be it'd be silly not to have another one, you know, because they would be leaving money on the table. Um, but I think it uh, I, mean, I hope it happens again. And um, although <laughs> last year we did lose our, our tag team championships, although we didn't get pinned. I'm glad you brought that up because I was I had to go of unfortunately again you did lose <laughs> your tag team <laughs> title but you didn't get pinned you, so technically you didn't lose yeah it was a uh, Rapungi Vice or whatever their stupid team name is in chaos but it was, they got pinned not us so uh, definitely I, I feel that Forbidden Door two happens uh, you know I definitely feel like uh, I'd want to be a part of it and the outcome I definitely want to change the outcome from last year. Now, who would you like to wrestle? Tag team action, singles competition. Is there a dream opponent besides Kenny Omega? Because we already established that you want Kenny Omega's ass and his belt. So who would you like to wrestle in AEW on a future AEW New Japan Forbidden Door pay-per-view? Well, you know, like somebody asked me this a while back. And um, when I did the uh, Ring of Honor uh, pay-per-view um, in December and looking at the uh you know, some of the champions that they have, you know, like before I left ring of honor in uh, at the end of 2019, you know, I was in line to, to get another ring of honor, uh, world championship, uh, title shot. So why, why wouldn't I want to do that again? And I mean, who's a champ now Cesaro? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. So, well, I mean, why not? Like, uh, I, I'd, I'd love to fight him. Uh, I mean, who's the uh television champ right now? Samoa Joe. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, I was gonna say, he just lost his TNT championship to Darby Allen on a recent episode of Dynamite. So yeah, they're uh they're separating the championships. I think slowly to establish that Ring of Honor is gonna be its own entity, and AEW will be its own entity, which I think a lot of fans want. They don't want to keep having a, a mishmash of oh this is this is but this is this but actually no it's all together so yeah th there's a lot of moving parts right now so you want gold it sounds like you right. want I mean what last night last when I was there I had the uh, Ring of Honor Television Championship undefeated and um, you know I, again I lost it in a multi man match which I don't know why management wants to put us in multi man matches they make no sense uh, but I didn't lose I didn't get a rematch uh, because. The champ at the time was scared I was coming back after him, but I ended up setting my sights on the heavyweight championship. So in my mind, I'm still the Ring of Honor television champion. Wow. And, um, you know, people always compare Samoa Joe to myself. I think that might be a, a Polynesian thing. Uh, but, you know, if, if I want to fight somebody, Samoa Joe is a great person to fight. Oh, man, give me Jeff Cobb and Samoa Joe on pay-per-view. It's a main event, as people will say, a main event in any territory because that would be outstanding and i think you versus claudio aka um cesaro for the championship belt the world title and ring of honor would be mm, beautiful as well because you you go back to like the beginning of aew you showed up on an episode of dynamite and i think the wrestling world was like flipped upside down because everyone was hearing the rumblings of oh the wwe wants jeff cobb oh aew wants jeff cobb he's still contracted to new japan like no one had the exact facts 
You showed up. It was a huge moment. Huge moment. You fought Moxley, and then you disappeared. What was the reasoning of the disappearance? Was there contract negotiations? Were you still contract to New Japan? Or is it like a visa? Th- what, what was it? Uh, well, originally, I was contracted to New Japan. Um, uh, Jan- I believe it was January of that year. Um, I had a contract uh, begin uh, with New Japan. And it was going to keep me there for at least a year. But I was going to and I was going to do multiple dates with AEW. Um, and then that whole worldwide pandemic thing hit. So that kind of just uh, pumped the brakes on a lot of things. And, um, you, you know, it's just and and going back, you know, like a lot of people give like Tony Khan a lot of a lot of grief and go for for things. Um, one of the things that I appreciated that what he did was he brought in a lot of non-contracted wrestlers during the pandemic and let them wrestle and gave them a payday because I mean, I was on the indie scene for about a good 10 years and you're not guaranteed money. Um, so, you know, you're, if you don't wrestle, you don't get paid. Mm. So that's the bottom line. And I was very like looking back on it as very touched and moved that what he did was he brought in a lot of indie independent guys that weren't getting a steady paycheck letting them wrestle and getting, you know, I mean, I don't know how much they're getting, but you know, it's definitely better than nothing. So like those kind of things, um, I was really appreciative of seeing that from the outside. So because of that, I was, you know, I was anytime he wanted to bring me in, I'm, I'm totally down to work with uh, Tony Khan. So what do you think you brought it up? What do you think Tony Khan does receive this random neg? I think anyone who is in wrestling receives it, but like Tony Khan or a Vince McMahon, Triple H really doesn't have that right now. He doesn't have. He we're in the honeymoon stage of Triple H being in charge of the WWE. So everyone's just like, oh, it's still beautiful. Everything's great." With Tony, the first year, maybe even two years, everyone was, "Oh, this is beautiful. This is lovely." And then once we rolled into, "Okay, we're out of the honeymoon stage," then people started critiquing heavily. Why do you feel that that's the case? Was it just again all these announcements and dream matches? You only can have so many. Eventually, you need to, you know, hunker down with your talent and push forward with stories. Um, you know, there's like <laughs> the internet wrestling community, you can't please them at whatever, like they want this, you give them that and they get upset that you gave them that. It, right. And then why did you give them this, you know? So like those kind of things, um, I mean, just like for personally, I try not to put too much weight into that just for the fact that like these guys, like the internet naysayers or whatever, yeah. if whatever critiques they give to me. It doesn't affect my paycheck. Right. Uh, if if my company's happy with what I'm doing, that's all that matters. Granted, I mean, there's there's people in, in this uh, business um, and and sport that I listen to their critiques and I take that to heart. But they're my close friends who aren't going to sugarcoat stuff. So, like, I, I I want like for me personally, um, I try to find that balance um, with negative critiques, which is only going to improve myself. Uh, I look at it more constructive criticism and, and in Tony Khan's situation, he is in a much bigger spotlight than I am. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I mean, you can compare it to like, for example, like if you compared me to John Cena, John Cena has probably a million times more negative naysayers than I do. And this, the way he handles it is great. You know, the rock or, or Roman Reigns or Seth Rollins, those guys, those guys have, tons of negativity towards them and you know i highly doubt uh john cena's uh staying up at night you know reading tweets that are <laughs> saying oh he was horrible in peacemaking something like that you know it's yeah, like yeah like just who cares like those those guys aren't aren't paying your bills so just just keep moving forward with what you have in mind i feel I'm gl- yeah i'm glad you said that because this Recently, as we're recording right now, you know, the whole Vince man forcing himself back on the board of directors of the WWE turned into like the Internet being like, oh, Vince, this, Vince, this, Vince, this. And I wrote a tweet and I think it really got them all good was, I'm sorry, do you own stock in the WWE? No, because it went up. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter your personal opinions. Is wrestling business? Is the business part making the money? Yes. Who cares if your your favorite didn't get pushed or didn't win their world championship match? Were they making money? You know, and that's I think the biggest part of uh, complaints of the internet is they're all going to complain all they want, but is there money on the line? 
when these other companies are putting forth these ideas of uh, having New Japan and AEW work together. That could have gone terribly wrong. It went terribly – not terribly right. That's a terrible thing to say. It went great. It went well. There was money being made. It was business. Maybe you didn't like the wrestling, but – it made money, the business part. So that I think that's a big problem with a lot of people. <laughs> they don't understand there's a difference, but you know. But was there gonna be more AEW dates? You said there was a few, but like where is it gonna be like you're gonna be traveling back and forth? Because if no one knows, me and you have been texting for like two months now getting this interview set up and you're in Japan and I'm in Boston and then you're back home and I'm like, oh, wait, what time zone are you in now? Like how is that transitioning with you working for New Japan? being with AEW was the the details kind of all put into place so COVID kind of blew that all up uh well originally um I was gonna go back and forth uh my main I mean I would in the in the in the before times uh we would come over <laughs> the before yeah. times I like it yeah in the before times we would just come over for tours and then we go back to um wherever we're living uh at the time I was living in Las Vegas so I'd go back back and forth and then you know, uh, if I was in between tours, then I would pop over to AEW. Mm. Um, I think originally it was like a 10, 10 appearance deal. Okay. Um, and then again, like I mentioned, the, uh, the world went uh, to hell in a handbasket. So, uh, yeah, so that kind of just went away. And then, and then with the whole travel thing, um, then when you come to Japan, you had a two week quarantine. So it's just, it just made stuff impossible to, I mean, we were able to go back to America, which is coming back to Japan. Like if you had like a month off, realistically, it turned into having two weeks off because you had to do quarantine. And, you know, that wasn't, you know, it's, it's not new Japan's fault. It's just the way the world was at the time. Um, and now with the restrictions lifted and, you know, we're able to go back and forth more. I mean, like a uh, prime example leading up to forbidden door last year, uh, we made, you know, not just myself, but like the United empire made a, a bunch of appearances over the summer leading up to uh, forbidden door. So uh, now that with the restrictions coming up or opening up, um, easing up, if you will, it's a lot easier to go back and forth. And it all just depends on, you know, if, uh, if I'm needed, if I'm not needed, it, it just all depends. Interesting. Now, so you seem like the perfect prototype now in the world of Vince McMahon, maybe even triple H as well, the, your size, your stature has, have you ever reached out to you and said like, "Hey, let's let's just chit chat and see where we go from here"? Because you seem like the perfect person. You compared yourself with the Samoa Joe comparisons often with fans given to you, but that seems like the easiest option. The WWE, like the Bronson Reeds, you know these these the, the big men who come in and smash people, has that ever opened up the door for you? Yeah, you know, like uh, I mean, like you going back to what you said earlier, you know, you know, WWE is a business, you know, and they're, yes. um, they're they've been doing it for oh, fifty plus years now, right, or sixty years or something. Mm -hmm. they, they, time, we'll just leave it at a long time. Um, so they're they're the the flag bearers for our industry, and um, so it all depends on what they want. Um, mm -hmm. originally my first tryout I ever had was in two thousand fourteen, mm -hmm. um. And at that moment or at that time, uh, six of us got pulled to the side, did some interviews, took some pictures. Um, and then it switched like, like in a couple of days or so, it was like, okay, well, we don't want anybody over 30. Um, and we don't want it, like, you know, we don't want this or whatever. So I was like, all right, cool. Well, and at that time, uh, NXT wasn't as huge as it, it as it right. eventually became. Um, I believe, uh, they just signed, um, uh, Kevin Owens at the time. And, oh, okay. Uh, wow. All right. So that's like so, the, like the first year of uh, of NXT on the W Network. So that's like, yeah, 2014. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So they had all these like influx of like uh, indie guys coming in um, or bigger name indie guys. So they were just like, okay, well, we don't want anybody over 30, but then we make exceptions to the rules about this. And then like a couple of weeks later or a month later, there was rumors or like, okay, well, well, we don't want any more independent guys because we have too many or, or whatever. So, right. It, it changes and that's totally fine. You know, I'm, I can't be upset about that because it's their business model and it's what they want to do with their company. So, um, yeah, so I didn't hear from them for a long time. Uh, just so happened, uh, right before the pandemic 2020, uh, I started getting phone calls from, uh, I mean, I don't know if I could, yeah, I could probably say it cause it's, it's not anything huge, but like William Regal would call me, uh, 
Brian Kendrick would call me and say, Hey, we're trying to like, is it cool? We pass your number to uh Canyon Seaman at the time. And, um, and I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm always open to talk to people, entertain talks or whatever. Um, and then this was actually around the time when New Japan and I were uh, figuring out a contract um, and contract situation. At the same time, AEW offered me a contract as well. So this is the first time I ever was like, oh, my gosh, I felt like the, the new girl in high school. All- <laughs> the belt, the ball. Yeah, all the, all the guys want to be with me because I'm new. Yeah. Uh, so it was it was really cool. Um, I got really close maybe in uh, the summer of 2021. Um, I was FaceTiming Kenyon Seaman a, a couple of times, um, about, I want to say like maybe June or July, somewhere around there. And uh, it got pretty close. Uh, I got to hear what they offered. And, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, there was a story that came out. It was like at the end of the day where, um, you know, I chose uh, what I was doing as opposed to going after the money. And people were giving me a lot of grief for that. I was like, you know what, at the end of the day, you know, I can make a great living being in Japan and doing a couple appearances here and there. Um, I mean, it may not be like WWE, the rock money, but you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a very low maintenance kind of guy. So I don't need millions and millions of dollars. Although, you know, people are like, you know, you're stupid for not taking it, but you know, at the time, and the good thing about it is um, I want to say about a few months after that conversation or a bunch of conversations with Ken Seaman is when he got fired and a whole, and then the huge, uh, I don't want to say, dumping of the roster happened. So, you know, I mean, you know, looking back, I think I made a, a good choice because if I went there and, you know, I could have been six months later, I could have been released and then go crawling back to another company for a job, you know. So, yes. And New Japan definitely took care of me uh, during the pandemic. They didn't have to. I mean, we still got paid. So, uh, you know, if they're loyal to me, I'm going to be loyal to them. Wow, that's a good story, man, because yeah, loyalty goes a long way with, I think, with a lot of people, um, and especially that the fact that you you were – somehow you read the tea leaves because bring, <laughs> bringing up the story of you're going to come in and then you're right about the dump of all these talents, it seemed like if you were a Triple H guy, whoever wanted – I don't know. It seems so weird. I've talked to a few people about that situation where it to them, it was very obvious. If you were a Triple H guy, you were getting dumped because they didn't want loyalty to another manager. They wanted you to be loyal to this new um, corporate entity that was going to run NXT, turning it into NXT 2.0. It, it, and I've talked to a few and they're like, yeah, it was very obvious that if you were a Triple H guy, you were out. So you being hired by his team would have been a red flag, a bullet on your head being like, hey, a bullseye on your head being like, all right, <laughs> get rid of this guy, which is insane that you just dump talent because they're loyal to another manager. But I get it. If you, In any corporate entity, um, any job, any new manager that comes in wants to bring in their people. They are, right. you know, it, It's not something new. And I think that's a lot of times with these wrestling fans. I don't know where wrestling fans actually work. You know, Do you work at a store? Do you work at a corporation? I work at a corporation. And guess what? I've seen it for 15 years. New manager comes in, they chop out the the managers underneath them and bring in their own people. And this manager gets chopped out, and then guess what? Same thing. It happens over and over and over again. But, man, was the money that the WWE offered the most money you've ever been offered, though? Uh, Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so why did you choose New Japan? Because of the – it was just an easier transition to just go back to what you were used to doing, or this was – loyalty all the way through um i mean a big part of it was loyalty um you know like i mentioned during the pandemic uh they were paying us and we didn't have to be paid mm. uh, realistically like ah sorry you know we're not running any shows they didn't any shows for a couple months um so you know uh, they didn't have to pay us really but they did um you know like there's uh another thing that got me too was uh one of, I mean, I don't know if, I mean, yeah, you know what, screw it, whatever. Like, Kenny Seaman said to me one time, is like, uh, through text, he's like, hey, listen, um, you know, like, if you come work with us, you're going to make a lot of money. And un- unlike other companies, we pay our talents. And that, I was like, oh, that's such a not, a, not, not a cool thing to say right. to on a court, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, because if you do that to other people, you can definitely do that to me. 
so it was more, more of a loyalty thing. Um, at the same time, the, you know, uh, I growing up as a kid, I definitely loved WWE or WWF at the time. And then when I got older, when I started wrestling, I started uh, loving the Japanese style. Right. Um, like, like the 90s, all Japan, uh, definitely New Japan later on. Um, just that style, it's, I, I, I love it. So, and I wanted to do it more. And me seeing the other product, not, it's a different type of product. And again, I can't get upset at that because that's, that's their business model. Um, so, but I felt like that's not going to fit me. So I just, you know, I figured I'd stick with something that, that I like to do. And then I also get the freedom to do what I want as well. Like, you know, if I, if a buddy's getting married, I'm able to go on the, on the mm. last minute. Like, Hey, can I, can I get this off for, for this? So. Right. I get, yeah. Dates versus time, obviously. Um, but I mean, sneeze. <laughs> God, I never sneezed on camera before. That was weird. If, over 300 interviews, my first sneeze. Jeff Cobb has has earned the sneeze award here today. Um, though with New Japan, forever it felt like I couldn't figure out if unless I was tape trading, like go back, you know, 15 years ago. If I wasn't tape trading, I wasn't able to watch New Japan. I had no idea how to even reach out and find it. And then Access Television started producing Ring of Honor shows. And Access TV was putting out New Japan shows. It was like the best of events. And you could see suddenly these matches I've never seen before. And that was really my introduction to American audiences being able to watch New Japan. Then obviously New Japan World opened up. And now you're able to stream and watch past uh, pay-per-views and events. And I think that's really what opened the door for a lot of American audiences to enjoy New Japan. And already in 2023 with Mercedes showing up, I think it's like, oh, wow. This isn't just for a niche audience. And I think that was like the feeling for some people. There was like, because the Dave, I think Dave Meltzer, unfortunately, I love Dave, but unfortunately, I think his critiquing of American wrestling versus uh, Japan wrestling really affected American fans because they're like, well, you only like it because it's Japanese wrestling. But it turns out it's actually amazing. But when you're only going through one tunnel of, of information from one person, you're like, well, he's obviously leaning to that because they're they're paying him or they're giving him, uh, you know, exclusive interviews. But how do you feel about New Japan growing as an, a company? Because it's not like it's going down. It is going up with American audiences around the world. Like, how do you think that is going for you and the talent? Um, I feel like. I mean, we were on a definite rise uh, bef in the before times. Uh, definitely, yes. I, mean, not, I mean, not just not just New Japan, like across the board, you know, every company took a, a massive hit uh, when the pandemic happened. And, you know, that's, you know, that's, uh, you, you can't get around that. It's It was a global event. It, it's, it's happened. It's still here, whatever. Um, so, I mean, we've, I feel like we've, I mean, like, again, with everybody, it's kind of, obviously went in the wrong direction, but I feel like in the last couple of years, especially like the last year and a half, um, we started to get our feet in the ground and running again. And we're definitely coming back up. And, and, and one thing too, like I feel was like a uh, new Japan strong was uh, definitely played a, a part in, in it because it was a, uh, you know, we, a lot of us were stuck in, in America and not able to come to Japan. So we started, you know, filming no no crowds or whatever uh, content for for New Japan World. And then at the same time, you know, a lot of the guys that we were using were contracted New Japan talent that was living in America, like, you know, myself and uh, Gorillas of Destiny and uh, Kenta and Jay White. And you know, so these guys are all big names. So us wrestling in America definitely helped that. And, you know, I think with that, and then now with the borders opening up and then now we're, you know, our roster and our talent are getting, are getting a chance to like integrate with each other. It's, I think it's definitely helping. It's get, it's making it fresher uh, with matchups and, and just stories and all that. And it's, and we're definitely going in the right direction. And then, you know, when Russell Keenan comes around, then they, they let the bid, they, you know, they open the bag of tricks and then here comes, you know, like a Mercedes comes out and a, an amazing main event or co main event with the, uh, Osprey and Omega and then uh, uh, Okada and, and White. Yeah. And then, you know, and then next day at New Year's Dash, I'm like, you know, it was, it was fantastic being in tune in. And then that sets off for where our, our storylines are going for the next uh, couple months. And then, 
and they would just start rolling from there. So I think, you know, it, it we're definitely on the right path. Yeah, New Japan Strong definitely introduced a lot of audiences to New Japan in a different light. Uh, Fred Rosser, you know, you have other talent that you people you recognize their faces, and then suddenly you start watching, and you go, "Oh wow, this is this is really good!" Like consistently good versus some shows where you're like, "That was a good show," and the next week you're like, "That was a bad show." Like that, I I haven't really seen a bad episode of New Japan Strong, so you know, kudos to that. But I want to move on to something else for a second because I've talked to other talent about Lucha Underground, and their experience with Lucha Underground is. <laughs> is a story. Some say they were treated like kings. Then as soon as the tapings were over, they were treated like peasants. What was your experience like? Because I haven't really heard a good, after the tapings are done, I haven't heard a good story. What was your experience like? Um, I think what they, like, I mean, I can't speak for the other talents. No, but, that's uh, why you, you personally, I talked to other people. What I assume they're talking about is, um, when we finished completing uh, filming a season, because um, we were all un- uh, under these uh, ridiculous contracts, it was like I think mine was like seven years. Um, but then it got then then we we're trying to figure it out, and they're like, ah, oh, we actually met seven seasons, and they're like, okay. But then someone else was like, no, it's seven cycles. I'm like, okay, well, I don't know what the hell a cycle is. Um, so, uh, so what is a cycle? Will you ever explain what a cycle is? No, <laughs> I've never heard that. In t- I've worked in TV for like 20 years. I, my entire life, I've never heard of a cycle. Seasons, obviously, years, of course, but right. cycles. No, so like, like while we were filming, amazing time. You know, uh, we, we were put in um, a nice uh, a nice Hilton. Um, I believe it was on Grand Street, right across the uh, the hotel that they filmed the Ghostbusters in, ah. uh, where they caught Slimer. So that, that, I mean, it was supposed to be in New York, but it was actually in L.A., but yeah, so we're, I mean, we're in downtown LA. Um, they had breakfast for lunch. They had, uh, they had breakfast, lunch, and, and sometimes dinner. Uh, most of the times, like we would just take extra food for lunch and then and eat that because it was so good. Yeah. So they, they fed us everything. You know, when someone got hurt, they definitely took care of us. Uh, when I got hurt, uh, punching through a glass window, I got workman's comp, which is wow. great. Um, but, uh, the negative side of it was when we finished filming a season, we weren't guaranteed when we're coming back. Like we finished filming season one. Okay. Well, when are we coming back? Uh, well, we don't know yet. Uh, we would get a lot of, um, I was like, Oh, we'll be back in like uh, three months. All right, cool. Um, three months comes along. Oh, sorry. Right. We're not coming back until like um, August. Okay. Well, well that sucks. Cause I, book i blocked everything off you know you know it's it's hard to make a schedule when they don't know their schedules right uh it was it was like a weird thing and then when we're like okay well can i go uh can i go work at impact like oh well it's tv so you can't work tv i was like okay well that's cool but then you know you see guys like uh and i'm not i'm not uh being negative towards him but you know more power to him but like john morrison showed up on impact i was like okay well how come john showed up and i did it and Mm -hmm. i can't talking to them like ah well he's under a different contract i said okay well that's kind of silly is where you're not letting us you can let us we're we're able to work independent dates but we're not able to work tv because it's uh it's a counterproductive to your tv but you're not telling us when we can or like when you're coming back so we had to just sit sit on our hands and wait for the thing to come back so that was that was like the main thing was i for me was not knowing when we're coming back and there's no consistent dates on those kind of things. And like at the time, like Lucha Underground was really hot. So yeah. I'm surprised they didn't want to capitalize on that. And it's, de- I don't think it was any of the writers. I mean, it's definitely not the writer's fault. It was once you bring in like TV executives and all that, I think it goes above all our pay grades and then it just goes crazy from there. Right. I talked to uh, Hernandez and he was, he was very adamant about saying like they wouldn't let him his contract. So he just eventually um, broke it. And just went to Impact and started wrestling there again. And they call him up on the phone. They're like, oh, what are you doing? And he's like, well, you're not really giving me any information about what's going on. So I need to make money and I need to pay my you know, bills and all this stuff. Because he was talking about the same thing. He was at hotels. They were feeding him. They were giving him energy drinks, power bars. He was just dumping him into his bag. They didn't care. They're like, oh, here you go. Here you go. Here you go. And then once the tapings were over, he'd call what's going on. They'd be like, oh, we don't really know. So sit on your hands. And that that's unfortunate for a business model where you're doing so well because Lucha Underground was like exploded. Like that 
announced. People were waiting for something so fresh. There was no AEW, you know, and, mm-hmm. and Impact was around, but Impact was not the way it once was when it was main eventing with Samoa Joe and Sting and Kurt Angle. Like it was still doing well, and it's still doing well, but it wasn't on Spike TV anymore. You know, it was it wasn't where it was at one point. So people trying to go there, you know, you get a payday. But Lucha Underground was like, whoa, what is this? This is so this is movies and TV and wrestling, and then then that happened. And unfortunately, when it showed up on Netflix, was there ever money being given to you for the Netflix streaming? Or that was just nope, it went to Lucha Underground. No, we we only got paid um when we filmed episodes. Mm. Or if we did um like little vignettes or whatnot. Interesting. Interesting. Well, at least you were much kinder about Lucha Underground than some people have been. So thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, I enjoyed my time there. I mean, yeah, like, I mean, realistically, everywhere you go, you're going to have like something that you don't like about things. That, I mean, either you're going to sit there and bitch about it or you're just going to, you know, do whatever. Eh, Push, whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. Because you could, you could, I, 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 again, I did a podcast with, with another person It hasn't aired yet, so I'm not going to say it, but <laughs> it, it turned into a 45 minute Lucha Underground rant. I'm like, ah, that's, a, that's fine with me. This is your opinion. This is your, your thoughts. I didn't work there. I just watched it on TV and thought it was really good, but still well, working with AEW randomly on those final battles and Ring of Honor pay-per-views. New Japan, New Year's Dash has happened. Okada and Kenny Omega. You're going after one of them. And I cannot wait to see what happens next with you in New Japan. It's growing every day. And in February, we have Mercedes and Cowdy going at it for the Women's Championship. There's so much happening. And finally, the stars align to allow us sitting here, me and you, Jeff, talking, texting nonstop, Facebook friends as well. Oh, we are Facebook friends. But I just want to say, Jeff, thank you so much for being here on 10 Count. It was a pleasure talking to you about everything underneath the sun, though we didn't talk about your eye. How is your eye? Uh, it's getting better. Yeah, I think someone poked me in the eye in the uh, the Rambo match. Or maybe it was, it was, maybe it was Kenny. I don't know. Uh, that's probably why I'm angry at Kenny. because he poked me in the eye. <laughs> well, there you go, folks. Breaking news. Jeff Cobb angry at Kenny Omega for giving him a three stooges poke in the eye. Oh, that. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for being here on Tan Count. I've been Steve Fall. He's in Jeff Cobb. He's going to get revenge for his eye from Kenny Omega soon. We'll see what happens. We'll see you next time, though. Bye-bye.